Here I am, climbing up, feeling great, getting love. Here I go, risk it all, be worth it now, and that's for sure. Watch me as I rock it deep. Right here we are, fight talk down under episode five. It uh, seems like just yesterday we were just it was just uh, fight talk down under was just something that was just existed in our inboxes it was just messages back and forth between uh, my co my co-host and I but uh, here we are five episodes in uh, my co-host of course is uh, is Lockjaw Justin Van Heerden Justin how are you mate um, good obviously yeah, as you know I sort of touched base with you there's some like torrential cyclonic weather sort of happening down here in Wollongong at the moment so uh, we've had some we had some sort of technical difficulties sort of getting here now and, and, and recording the episode today, but we're here, we're doing it, so uh, so that's good. I'm pretty stoked. Yeah, that's no, good. We're, uh, we're happy to have you here. We obviously had a bit of a hiccup last night as well with some uh, some feral children on both ends there, so um, you know, yep. we're, we're here. It's Tuesday night. We're managing to record, so uh, you know we, we push through. We endure. We made it. You know, we, we're taking these little hiccups, these little challenges, and we're just we're just pressing on. So as long as we keep doing that, we can keep putting out this content and then our, our, our listeners can, uh, can, can get their fix. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, get their fix they will and this week. Um, yeah, we'll, we've, we'll pretty much cover off um, uh, UFC 272 from the weekend. Um, yeah, we'll get, there's plenty to cover from that one, of course, uh, starting with Jamie Malarkey, who was our Australian representative on the card. Um, obviously didn't, uh, didn't go his way in the end. He's, um, he's been a training partner of yours, so I'm sure you'll have some, uh, some in- insight for us. But the, the fight sort of, um, I guess it kind of started out as, as you'd expect. Malarkey was fighting at a bit of a furious pace there and... And you know he found a home for that left hook that he's been, uh, you know he's been make, he's been wrecking opponents with uh, in his recent fights and even stuck a takedown in round one. But in the end, it kind of felt like he probably took a few too many shots on the way out and uh, and he got put away uh, early in the second round. So um, yeah, what, what what did you make of it? Yeah, obviously you know not the result that we we all wanted, and certainly not the result that that Jamie would have wanted. Um, especially after the, the killer camp he put on and, and the kind of shape he was in and, and the work that he did. But, um, yeah, obviously I, um, I waited till, you know, a couple of days till, till about this morning to message him, you know, flick a message to him and, and kind of touch base with him and see, see how he was going. Um, obviously he's disappointed. We're always going to be disappointed after a loss, but, you know, already the guys focused on getting back to work, improving, moving forward. And then that's always good to see. And that's kind of what you need. Um, he's no stranger to it, you know. He's had to do it before, but he's someone that's going to take take the the good things out of this performance, correct the bad things that happened, and be able to move forward and build up. Um, I certainly, even just after talking to him today, kind of even more so, it's just kind of drilled it into me that you know the guy believes that he's going to be world champion one day, and and, and I believe that he's going to be a world champion one day. So, yeah, obviously he's a bit bummed with the result, but yeah, I think he said. Yeah, it was just that. It was just a case of, you know, being normally where he's so disciplined with the head movement and able to to move out on the exits and, and avoid those shots. I think, you know, this time around, it was, it was just sort of that wasn't happening as well. Obviously, he adjusted towards the end of the first round, got the takedown um, and was able to, you know, put Jalen on his back and kind of control him quite, quite easily uh, considering, you know, Jalen's quite dangerous on the mat as well and he's a very long guy he's got long limbs you know he's, he, he could throw up submissions quite easily triangles all that sort of stuff so Jamie managed to kind of shut all that down and, and control him so heading into the second round I thought okay he's made the adjustment he's, his fight IQ is good he's going to be like okay let's let's do those sort of things let's get in let's make it a sort of gritty fight let's lay in those shot, shots from the inside and then ultimately let's level change and take him down and and, and wear on him and then kind of, you know, go from there. But obviously Jalen was able to make his own adjustments and reads. And obviously Jamie's got really good head movement and he's constantly dipping and rolling and slipping. Um, and uh, Jalen r- made a good read on that. And every time Jamie was kind of doing that, he would throw that knee up the middle and then that was landing a couple of times. So I think that, you know, that wasn't helping the situation. And then obviously, like you said, the, the couple of extra shots on the exit, where you, you might have landed one or two, but you're wearing three or four on the way out, you know, obviously that's going to accumulate and take a toll on you. Um, but like I said, man, he's, he's in, he's overall, he's in, he's in, you know, good sort of, good sort of spirits. Obviously you're going to be disappointed and upset, but 
he's um he's he's the type of guy that's going to get straight back to work. Um, I won't be surprised if as soon as he's back from the USA, if he's back down here in camp helping Volk prepare for for Zombie and just carrying on as normal. Do you have any uh, insight on the stoppage itself? Like it kind of it didn't look like a sort of a concussive sort of punch, as it were. It seemed to seem to kind of land on the ear by watching the. Um, by, by watching the replay and, and he seemed to sort of fold in, in in pain almost it was almost like it might have sort of cracked his jaw or something like that did you um you know get any sort of insight on on sort of what led to the stoppage there no nah, i didn't didn't sort of go into detail with him yet about you know how how much he had how hurt he was after that that sort of shot but you know just from my own sort of point of view when you are in a fight and you do get clipped in that spot there where you're going behind the ear sort of on the jaw behind the ear you know that's that's that sweet spot like that if that doesn't put you out just and put you like unconscious straight away yeah it's it's going to ring your bell a little bit those are the ones that kind of kind of dig in a bit especially if you throw someone's throwing them looping shots you know because if you can kind of the way to sort of explain it is like if someone's throwing punches at you and you can kind of see the punches even though they might like you and maybe you know you're you're moving or whatever and they're they're sort of landing because you kind of you can you can see them coming and you can you can make the read that there's punches there, even if they land, you're kind of already kind of bracing for it, and your your body's kind of reacting to it. But some of those Take ones that yeah, and some of those ones that sneak around the guard or kind of come from an angle and loop around and then just clip you behind the ear, and then all of a sudden you know you, your brain's not just it's like a shock to the system. So um, yeah, I certainly you know Jalen looks like someone that hits pretty hard as well. So I can't imagine that you know, would have would have been great to get hit by him in general, especially not in a place like that where it's sort of behind the ear and, and where it's gonna ring your bell that little bit extra. But um yeah. I, I imagine that like just knowing Jamie, knowing the type of person he is, seeing him the work that he does and, and watching some of his previous fights and like you obviously watch like the Brad Riddell fight and stuff like that. He's not just someone that quits and just kind of throws in the towel and just gives up. If if he went down I, I'd imagine it was yeah because he was you know got got caught with with with, with a good shot you know because he's certainly the last person that I would put into the category of you know just getting clipped and then just bitching it. Absolutely, and his opponent Jalen Turner actually pointed to that in the in the post fight press conference. He said he's uh, he, he lit him up with some hard shots, and he said his um, his toughness, like his. Um, you know, his resilience was just second to none. He said it was incredible. Um, because, like, Jalen Turner's a, he's a finisher. We, we can just look down his record. He's got, uh, I think, 11 wins on his record, nine KOs and three submissions. So, you know, the guy's a, the guy's a dangerous guy. And he's, um, you know, he, 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 stopped, he, he wins all his fights inside the distance. And, yeah, he said that... Um, you know, he hit Jamie with some shots that have put other fighters away, and Jamie just kept coming. So, you know, that's that's uh, I, I guess as good of a, a compliment as you can get from someone like Jalen Turner in a in, in a defeat like that is, um, you know, that he sort of walked through things that other people didn't. But, but I mean, to, like Jalen Turner now, he, he's um, he's proven to be a bit of a bit of an Aussie killer, as we sort of touched on in the in the episode last week. You know, he's he's got a TKO of a of a Callan Potter. Um, and Josh Kulabau. Um Now he's added Jamie Malaki to his list, and he uh, and he named uh, Brad Riddell as someone who he'd like to fight next uh, in his uh, in his post-fight press conference as well. So he's obviously got a got a uh, a taste for the uh, for the Anzac uh, Anzac blood in the end. But you know, during the fight, he really seemed just super composed, like a, against a guy like like Malaki, who's in your face, fights at a pace, hits hard. You know, he just he didn't seem to he didn't seem rattled by anything really that uh, that Jamie threw at him. He just controlled range. He wasn't excha- he wasn't afraid to uh, to exchange with Malaki in close. So, like, how how good do you feel like uh, Jalen Turner is? Like, how how far do you think he can go? Yeah, man, that dude's talented. Like, obviously, and you know his his comments post fight would, would sort of touch on the respect that he had for Jamie coming in as well. You know, and. Like that division is just so crazy with the talent that's coming up. Like obviously someone like Jalen Turner, he could do some great things in that division. He's a big guy for the division. He's tall, he's long, rangy, obviously hundred percent finish rate, the guy puts people away. Like if you give him an opportunity, he's gonna take advantage of it and, and he's gonna finish the fight. So he's got all the the tools and skills and sort of, you know, aggression and and, and sort of killer instinct to, to be able to go far in the division. It's going to be interesting to see how he matches up um, against some of these other guys that 
have a bit more experience, a bit more of a stronger sort of wrestling and grappling pedigree and can mix it in real well. Um, that's going to be interesting to see because obviously, uh, you know, we saw towards the end of the first round, Jamie took him down and he didn't really, it, you know, he was trying to move, trying to throw stuff up, trying to do stuff, but was able to, you know, Jamie was able to kind of, control him quite easily on the ground and kind of keep him in position and you know you look at that division there's a few guys in that division that you kind of don't you know you, you do some you do some shit like that you, you're gonna have a bad night like even a couple of weeks ago you look at someone like Saruki and who just fought you know if he was to match up with someone like that you know he's on the Jalen's on a bit of a win streak he's, he's doing quite well you know if he's gonna fight someone who's, who's in that top 15 you might get matched up with someone like that the UFC's been known to do stuff like that they don't really care you match up him with a guy like Saruki and he's going to get the shit beat out of him. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how he um, handles that sort of stuff. If he is actually as well-rounded as, as it seems that he is, looking at it on paper. But, yeah, I feel like he can do really well. But um, I also feel like it's, it's, yeah, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a weird one because whenever someone finishes someone and all their fights have been finishes and it's usually like fairly quickly into the fight. It's hard to kind of go, okay, well, you know, this person's going to be a stone cold killer and is going to be able to just fly through because you haven't seen what it's like when they, when they're experiencing adversity, you haven't seen how they adjust when they aren't able to do that. You know, what's he going to, how's he going to be if he gets put on his back in the first round and he's for five minutes, he's on the bottom getting his head punched in He's got to come out for a second round. His arms are heavy. His legs are heavy. And he's got to like, you know, he's got to progress forward and, and, and try and make those adjustments. He might do just that and he might still find that finish. Or there's a very good chance he breaks down completely and crumbles under that adversity because he doesn't have the opportunity to finish the fight and it's not going his way. Yeah, exactly. It's always the question mark with someone like that, isn't it? When he's been finishing people on the feet, you just, uh, yeah, it's, it's always the big test at, at UFC level is once you come up against someone with that wrestling pedigree. And I love that Sarukian matchup. That's fantastic. I think, uh, you know, Justin Van Heerden should be, uh, you know, UFC. Look, honestly, if the, if the UFC want place. me to, if they want me to match, make some fights, I'll gladly do it. I'll put, so, I'll put the fights in that people want to see. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see, Jalen take on someone in the top 15 in his next fight and for Jamie I'd like to see Jamie you know he's obviously going to rebuild and work on those things that kind of went wrong for him keep improving the things that went right and then um, yeah I'd like to see him maybe come back you know probably June July uh, potentially you know get get, get back in and, and, and kind of um, yeah get stuck in you know there's a few interesting matchups. The division's obviously stacked, but obviously, uh, you know, we, we've seen with some of these uh, the matchups that, the, that they offer these Anzac fighters, you know, they're, they're not, the sympathy is really not there. So you obviously just fought someone like Jalen Turner. Before that, he fought Devontae Smith. Before that, he fought Carmen Worthy. All these guys have like, you know, they've got the ability to put your lights out when they hit you um, and they're dangerous matchups. So I, I think that, if as soon as he's back in there, it's going to be no different. They're going to feed him into another sort of killer. And it's going to be, you know, I feel like he's going to be able to, to come back and, and put on another sort of 50 K bonus type performance. Yeah. There's no uh, padding of records in the UFC is there. They just throw, uh, throw everyone to the, w- the wolves and, uh, yeah, made the, the strongest, uh, survive really. And, and I think, uh, you know, Jalen Turner, he's probably earned that, uh, that top 15 opportunity. I think both Malaki and Turner are probably on the, on the cusp of the rankings there. He's obviously just beaten Malaki in, um, in emphatic fashion there. So he's probably earned that, uh, earned that right. But, um, yeah, Malaki, no doubt that he's going to get thrown another another killer, and um, yeah, I, I think that's probably a vote of confidence in a lot of ways from the UFC that they they really believe that uh, you know he can he can hang with these guys and he can have exciting fights with these um, with these finishes and and look up until the weekend he had passed all those tests with flying colours, you know he put away Karma Worthy and Devonte Smith as you mentioned there who are both really dangerous fighters, so um, you know there's there's no real reason to uh, to doubt him, so hopefully they they throw him another fun one next, but. Yeah, it'll be fun to see uh, to see where he goes. And now in the um, in the main event, we had uh, Covington versus Masvidal. Now, obviously, there was a huge build up to this one, given their uh, their history as uh, as former teammates. And 
You know, we we talked about the wrestling skills being the the big leveler in the, in this one in uh, in episode four, and uh, and and so it proved in the end. Justin Van Heerden was uh, was on the money once again with his uh, with his prediction there, and you know, Masvidal dropped uh, dropped Covington to a, to a knee at least in in round four. But outside <laughs> of that, really, it was um, yeah, it was all all uh, Colby Covington. So um, yeah, how how did you uh, how do you break that one down? I think that they did an excellent job at selling what was always going to be a one-sided fight. I think they finessed us all. I don't even think that they really hate each other as much as they portrayed it to be. I feel like, because I was watching the broadcast and then I watched it back even, and end of the fourth round when the ref splits them apart and they're kind of jabbering with each other or talking at each other, Masvidal clearly says to Colby, he says, five more minutes and we get paid. That's a weird thing to say to a dude that you dislike, <laughs> apparently. So, yeah. No, but obviously, you know, they got after it a bit. Um, yeah, Covington got dropped, whereas he said he took a knee for the first responders. Um, <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, Colby did what Colby does. He's the second best welterweight on planet Earth, and it, and it showed. Um, and he showed that, Masvidal, even though he made those, he made somewhat of improvements. He definitely had some defensive wrestling improvements and was able to sort of, you know, deal with it a bit better than he did in the first Usman fight. But ultimately, you know, the grappling pedigree, the wrestling pedigree, the grind, the pace that Colby puts on just wore on him. And uh, yeah, he was able to, he was able to sort of just pick Masvidal apart and just do his thing. You know, George even touched on in the post fight, he said that, you know, he had him hurt in the fourth and he was just, yeah, didn't capitalize on it. And even after the fight in the initial chat in the octagon, he kept talking about being too flat footed and too, too, like lazy with the wrestling defense and the defensive wrestling. And he kept saying the wrestling, the wrestling, the wrestling, which says to me that your whole camp and plan and game planning and the work that your coaches at ATT did was all the wrestling focus, the wrestling focus, the wrestling focus. So that means to me that they didn't then still highlight and go, well, here's where you can be dangerous. Here's the, here's the stuff that you can do, um, do some work in. And obviously, so when he buzzed Colby, he didn't follow up because in his mind, he was like, I've got to worry about the wrestling. I've got to worry about the wrestling. I've got to worry about the wrestling. He didn't follow up. He didn't capitalize, um, which was super strange to see. Another thing that I noticed about the fight that was really weird is Masvidal looked a lot bigger than usual. You know, he looked a, a bit beefier than usual. He actually, I feel like he was, I know Colby says that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't cut a lot of weight for welterweight, but Masvidal certainly looked a lot bigger than he normally does. And I'm wondering if that was also part of the, part of the sort of plan to kind of beef up a bit, be a bit bigger. So the R in these wrestling exchanges, it's probably a bit harder for Colby to kind of take you down. Um, I don't know if that was part of the plan or if that was sort of like a, yeah, just a, a kind of game plan type thing or, or, or maybe just laziness, who knows? But he certainly, yeah, he certainly didn't look as lean and as mean as he did coming into the second Usman fight. Um, you know, he had the extra bit of body weight there. You could see it kind of hanging over the shorts and the tights a little bit, which is weird to see for someone like Masvidal because usually he's in shape. The dude comes correct. Um, even in the first fight with Usman when it was on short notice, he cut all that weight. The dude was in shape. He was already at a bit extra weight to cut, but the guy was in shape. You could tell he was in some sort of shape. Um, so whether that played a factor or not, I don't know. It certainly, you can certainly see that he was he was a bit destroyed after the fight, and he and he was wrecked. You know, his cardio pretty well gone, even though he went the full distance. Um, yeah. So what to do with that fight? What to do with both of those guys? Obviously, Colby won. He's in a weird spot. He's lost to the champ twice. Had Masada won, it's the same sort of scenario. I feel like Colby needs to beat someone else and then kind of puts himself back right back in there for a third Usman fight. But, you know, he's obviously asked to fight Dustin Poirier, whether that happens or it doesn't happen. I don't know. Uh, it's a weird, it's a weird sort of fight. It's a weird sort of call out to make. I saw someone speaking about an interesting fight to put together for would be Covington versus Bobby Knuckles. If Bobby Knuckles is a bit weird, you know, weird on where he wants to be and if he wants to drop down or move up or whatever he wants to do, and that could be an interesting matchup. It'd be a, it'd be a bit, bit be a really good matchup to see a welterweight for Masvidal he just signed the biggest or third highest contract in UFC history um, you know he's the third highest paid athlete behind Adesanya and Connor. I feel like for Masvidal you got to you got to regroup and then try and pursue some of these money fights as we call them you got to be trying to get that Conor McGregor fight you got to be trying to get that Nate Diaz rematch you know 
you know, try and try and build that up um, and capitalize on the fact that you're you're making all this money now. Um, it sounds harsh to say, but I don't see Masvidal winning the world title at that weight division, especially not against guys like Usman and Covington, whose wrestling pedigree is so high. And then you got to talk about guys like Hamzat, guys like Gilbert Burns, who also horrible matchup stylistically for someone like Masvidal. Um, by all means, if there was a if there was a world where uh, you know you made an agreement and you said no takedowns, Masvidal could piece up a lot of these dudes um, on the feet. Potentially, I, well, not Usman. Obviously, we saw that in the second fight. Usman knocked him clean clean out. But um, yeah, he's a he's still a dangerous fight for a lot of people, and he's still one of the top welterweights in the world, no doubt. But as far as winning the belt, I I can't see that happening. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> for Covington's part, he's sort of, uh, you know, he recognises that he's 0-2 against Usman, so he sort of needs to put himself into a fight that's going to do some good numbers in the interim. And I think the, the storyline with uh, Dustin Poirier and ATT probably made sense to him at the time. Um, so, you know, that, that could be something that's going to make him some money in the interim while he sort of tries to get himself back into a to a fight with Usman but uh, but Masvidal's an interesting one like you mentioned there was a, he's, he signed the uh, the third highest uh, you know contract in UFC history there and you know he's now, now he's now got three losses in a row like he had a good run there you know he, he beat uh, beat Diaz for that BMF belt he um, he knocked out Darren Till uh, over in the UK and then obviously there was the Askren knockout which really kind of launched him into the stratosphere and um you know, but now he's 37 years old. He's probably looked a little bit out of sorts in his in his last couple of fights, and and as you sort of mentioned there, the takedowns have, have been his Achilles heel along the way. So it's kind of a, a curious thing. We we know he has drawing power, um, but you know, with with the losses that he's racking up, and potentially at, at his age, and with maybe losing a bit of form there, it's, it seems kind of a curious thing to to sign him to such a massive uh, deal at this stage of his career. Well, even now, like obviously, I'm. I, I fight and from a fighter point of view I can like make all these assessments but like for someone okay so like I'll ask you this question when you see that Masvidal is booked to fight right moving forward he's obviously like you said on he's on he's on a he's three losses back to back now you know if if moving forward the UFC announces a fight for Masvidal are you going to be hyped for it or are you kind of going to be like mm, well you know is this like what are we? About, uh, what's like? Is this going to be worth watching? Because they obviously think that he's worth a shit ton of money, and they've signed this contract with him. So they think it's kind of a similar situation to like the McGregor, where it doesn't matter if he wins or he loses or what the go is. When he's fighting, you kind of want to tune in. Do you think that that's the same? Is that something that you, from your point of view, do you think that that's the same thing? Well, yeah, I'm I'm always stoked to watch uh, watch Masvidal fight, but uh, sort of given his recent form, it's probably lost a little bit of the the shine for me. Like he's, um, you know, he obviously got. Uh, I, I guess that sort of invincibility kind of got smashed when he when he got knocked out by by Usman, and then um, obviously looked a bit out, out of sorts on the weekend. So, you know, it's probably not something that I would sort of set aside a weekend now to to watch Masvidal fight. But it, uh, it it's always it's 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 icing on the top, but. You know, if, if they're signing this guy to a huge contract, I think you know he needs to be like a headliner, like the big draw. And they've obviously got all the metrics as well. They they they've obviously recognised that he moves the needle uh, from where they sit. So it, it would have to make sense for them. But it's probably lost a little. Like Masvidal's probably lost a little bit of the shine for me. Um, yeah, in in his recent outings. Yeah, I can't I can't see myself getting hyped to see Masvidal fight, especially not where he is in the division and, and you look at the matchups that they're going to give him moving forward. If you're talking about non-money fights, like, you know, the guys that he's going to potentially get matched with is like Burns, Wonderboy, Luke, guys like that who are trying to build themselves up and secure like a title shot type, type deal. And like, man, they're not good matchups for the guy. Burns is a horrible matchup for him. Luke is a horrible matchup for him. Wonderboy already pieced him up. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's a hard position to be in. And then obviously he does go on. Okay, let's go to the other end of the thing. You say, okay, the guy picks himself up, dusts himself off, goes on a mad run, knocks a few people out, gets a few wins behind him. And then the UFC is like, okay, you have the Covington mat, uh, rematch. It's not going to turn out any different. Or they go, by some miracle, he racks up a bunch, enough wins and it works out. He fights Usman again. It's, I don't see it going a different way. 
Um, I don't. I, I I wouldn't put my money on a knockout for Usman like a, like like he did in the second fight. I feel like it, it could happen, but like I feel like it'd just be more of a you know he gets grinded out and pounded out over a certain time and kind of finished on the ground, unless you know the guy just yeah makes some serious adjustments in that department and kind of builds himself up. But I just can't see it. Like we said, man, he's thirty seven years old. The dude's had fifty MMA fights. He's not going to change anything drastically at this point now. Um, well, at least I don't see that happening. I don't see him doing um, something as major as that and pulling a Glover Teixeira type move and, and coming back and winning the belt because I feel like old habits die hard. The dude's just going to want to scrap. That's what he's known for. Started in the streets, made it to the big show, and that's kind of what's worked for him and propelled him into the, the stratosphere of fame in the sport. I don't see him changing that, and unfortunately... The division he's in and the people that he's fighting in, the, in, in you know, in the top of the division, it just doesn't match up well. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, and uh, I like the the Luke fight. I think that's a that's a fun one on paper, but but really uh, taking matchups like that for someone like Masvidal and, and the star power he has, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Like that's a really expensive gatekeeper for the UFC to have. You know, if he's going to start fighting some of these up and coming guys like. Uh, like Luke, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, really, all all that's left for Masvidal, obviously, barring another run at the title, like you said, is you know just novelty fights. Whether he, um, you know, he fights, I don't know, Dustin Poirier or Conor McGregor or you know, um, Nate. Uh, I don't know if the, I don't know if a rematch with Nate Diaz really uh, really tickles my fancy that much. It was sort of a bit of a bit of a one handed, uh, sorry, one sided fight in the end. So, but those there's always the the Leon Edwards fight too. There's always the Leon Edwards fight, like hype wise, you could hype that fight up and do something, but Leon would beat the crap out of him. Like, let's be honest, that that would be a horrible matchup. But um, that could, yeah, could do that. That's another fight. There's obviously the Connor fight. Connor's looking a bit beefier than usual at the moment, so <laughs> you know you could put that fight together and welterweight and kind of just get it going, make it make it a big spectacle. Um, yeah, it's going to be a hard sell trying to do the Nate rematch. Obviously, they. I think they said that they both did say that after the first fight that they'd run it back, but it's a hard thing to sort of put together. And then, yeah, the Leon Edwards fight based on their sort of history with each other and him hitting him in England after he knocked out Darren Till and all that sort of stuff. Um, which, funny enough, that actually in the in the last couple of days, um, a friend of mine who's who's from England who is you know kind of grew up in Birmingham near you know sort of in liaise in sort of similar circles as as uh as edwards growing up uh i've been told apparently when that happened right they used like a police escort to escort masvidal out of the arena straight to the airport because the guys that edwards is associated with um they weren't just looking to like beat on masvidal like they were going to kill him so the ufc was like let's get some cops Let's let's escort him straight to the thing. Let's get him out of the country, because um, like you know, had they not done that, if they just tried to get him back to the hotel or whatever, then he might not be walking around to to be this uh, great big personality that he's turned into that we've seen. Yeah, and Leon Edwards has got some connections there. That's uh, yeah, that's an interesting yeah. Some unsavory characters are in, involved in uh, in Leon Edwards. Absolutely, there you go. But I think that matchup, you know, obviously they they've sort of uh, hyped it themselves with the whole three piece in a soda sort of uh, situation, you know, backstage there. But I think that one's really predicated on because uh, Leon Edwards is sort of owed a title shot really at this point. So th- that matchup would really be predicated on Edwards sort of shaking out of the out of the rankings a little bit. I think, um, you know, it would it would kind of be a hard sell for you know Edwards who's on the cusp of a title shot to then take on. I believe he Nadal. is next. Yeah, exactly. So it seems like, uh, you know, he would have to sort of uh, maybe lose the title or maybe he would have to win the title and Masvidal would have to reel off some wins or whatever. But it feels like that one's sort of a little a little way down the track. It would be hard for the, you know, the UFC to put those two together in, in the short term, I would have thought. But I, I um, agree. Yeah. But also, look how unlucky Leon Edwards has been. The poor guy's had, like, the worst luck out of anyone. So, you know, I don't want to throw more bad luck the guy's way but you know potentially the guy could potentially get stitched up again with some stupid sort of situation and then obviously you know and then they might be like well you know we can't do the Usman fight but we got Masvidal and then he might take it just to stay active which he 
he has done with all these some of these other matchups, you know, especially like with like you know the fight with with Bilal Muhammad and stuff like that. Really, the guy should have had a title shot already, and he keeps taking these other fights because the guy's obviously a competitor and wants to stay active. Um, but yeah, so I could potentially see something like that happening. But mm. yeah, like you said, it doesn't really make sense outside of that that for him to fight Masvidal. I guess in a sporting sense, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, does it? But uh, yeah, like you say, you, you could see it happening. Like you could see the UFC just saying, look, we've got another opponent for Usman, whoever it is, <clears throat> you know, maybe just take Masvidal in the meantime. We'll give you a couple of thousand extra or something, you know, we'll make it a bit of a money fight. And, and knowing Edwards' luck, you could see him getting clipped with a punch and then, uh, you know, the title shot going up in smoke again, you know. It's, it'd, it'd be a risky manoeuvre, but I think he's shown that he's pretty content to um, to sort of sit back and wait for a title shot. But anyway, we're here on uh, for Fight News Australia. So, uh, you know, we, we do have some Australian representatives uh, in other promotions. Well, we, we did have some Australian representatives coming up in other <laughs> promotions. We've got, uh, we've had a bit of a uh, bit of misfortune and, we, and we'll get to that. But um, we've got one championship um, lights out this weekend. It's uh, it's Friday night. It's headlined by Tan Lee versus Gary Tonin, which is actually a really fun fight in itself. And um, John Lineker fights for the title over there against Bibiana Fernandez. So... There's some fun fights, and uh, an Australian on the card, uh, well, there's two Australians on the card. One is um, Martin The Situation Nguyen, who's a former two-weight champion in uh, in one championship. He's taking on Kirill Gorobitz, I think is how we might pronounce that uh, that name there. So, um, uh, so Martin Nguyen, you know, he's, he lost his uh, featherweight title to Tan Lee, who's uh, headlining this uh, this card in his last fight, and he, uh, sorry, two fights ago, and he has since lost to Kim Jae Wung, so he's on a... Um, you know, a two-fight skid. Um, the interesting thing with Martin Nguyen is that he's a huge star in Asia because of, uh, you know, obviously his exploits. You know, he, he once was, uh, you know, had the two belts in one championship, but uh, no one's really heard of him here in Australia. And it's and it's fascinating. I actually brought this up with him in an interview I had with him a while back. He doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, which is unbelievable given his, uh, his accomplishments in the sport. But, uh, you know, he's been training at Sanford MMA recently for his, uh, for his fight camps and... Um, you know, he's going to want to, um, you know, he's a close friend of Ong La Song, who's a, a huge star in, in one championship and uh, and had a devastating loss against Vitaly Big Dash on the on the weekend as well. So he's going to be keen to uh, to sort of to, to, to get one back for his mate there, I think, and, and get himself back on track for the title. Um, he's, he's got uh, uh, Gorobitz, who's making his one debut. Um, he's mostly fought on his on home soil uh, in the Ukraine. Um, and so obviously, given the situation over there, he's going to be uh, emotional himself. So um, it, it's going to be an interesting matchup there. But uh, have, have you had a look into this one? And uh, you know, how do you view uh, Martin Newen's uh, situation at the moment? Yeah, I just want to see that guy get back to where where he was, man. Obviously, I got a, yeah, I got a lot of I got a lot of time and respect for that dude. He's super cool. He's super cool. And to see you know him go from where he was to the the sort of misfortune he's experienced recently, and, and to where he's at now is pretty rough. Obviously, you know. Um, but I still have full confidence that that guy is going to be able to come back, build himself back up, get back to a title shot, win the belt back, and, and kind of get back to, to sort of where he was. Um, he's got that sort of world championship mentality, and, and obviously he's shown what he's capable of inside that one circle numerous times. So, um, yeah, I feel like, you know, this matchup's obviously intriguing. Whenever you're fighting someone from an Eastern Bloc country, you got to know that, they're gonna they're gonna be gritty. They're gonna be tough. They're gonna be able to grapple. They're gonna be able to wrestle, and they're gonna be able to to go for days. As you said, being from the Ukraine, he might be a bit emotional. He might be even more charged up to come out there and win and kind of uh, show that you know Ukrainians are warriors and they're tough people, and 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 that they they aren't gonna be um, be oppressed by by what by what Russia's doing over there in that part of the world at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how that pans out. I, I'd like to see, you know, Martin just kind of come out and do his thing and, and you know, land that right hand, land that overhand right and and and, and, uh, and close the show. But, um, yeah, he's obviously in a tough position, but he is a massive star. So I don't. it's not like we're in a situation where if he loses this fight, one championship turns around and goes, all right, catch you later, we, we don't need you anymore. The dude's too big of a draw, too big of a star. And, you know, the views and numbers that they actually reel in on for one championship is actually – pretty crazy and to think of all that and like you said that he he's sort of a bit unknown um unless you're sort of involved in the sport a lot of people don't know about the guy which is crazy considering some of the performances he's had and some of the stuff that he's done and accomplished it makes no sense to me the guy should be a 
absolute superstar back here. Absolutely, yeah. and like one championship is just a it's a huge deal in Asia, and uh, just sort of it's it's still kind of catching on here in the in sort of the the Western world, I guess. But um, you know. Um, uh, Martin Ewan is, uh, you know, just one of one of the guys at the coalface, like you say there, and um, you know, yeah, it's, it's not exactly a loser leaves, leaves town sort of situation, really, for yeah. him. He's uh, obviously going to have his place in one championship for a long time to come, just because people love him over there. But you know, he, he is fun to watch, and and like you mentioned, that overhand right, he's one of those fighters where. Like you know what he's going to try and do, but he, he still uh, you know he still manages to get it done. He just finds a way, and um, you know that over right overhand right is um, you know, something else. He's put some guys out uh, you know, pretty spectacularly over there. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun one, and uh, and uh, yeah, like like you say as well, he's a lovely guy. Um, I have interviewed him once before, and and you know he was just uh, he was just in his hotel room over in uh, over in Florida. He'd, be, he'd just been training at uh, at Sanford at the time, and. And he was happy to sort of uh, hang around for a, a chat afterwards as well. He, he gave a it was like it was a longer interview than I normally do, and um, yeah, so um, yeah, lovely guy. He's a guy that you really want to see do well. So um, yeah, I, I do. Hope He's he also up. an absolute gun at Call of Duty. I don't know if people know that, but the guy streams and plays Call of Duty every now and then. Absolute beast at that too. He's like world championship level at that as well. Um, it's quite frustrating. I've come up against him a few times on on. On the old uh, online gaming, and um, yeah, he slapped me up a few times, but we always have some good banter and, and stuff like that. So that's why I said I, I got a lot of time for the guy, and I want to see him do well. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I didn't know that he had that string to his bow as well. He's uh, knocking people out in uh, in Call of Duty as well. So uh, yeah, there you go. Um, also on the card, speaking of lovely guys, um, uh, also on the card was supposed to be uh, Reese McLaren. He was uh, supposed to take on Ji Wei. Um, uh, and we've just found out earlier today. Actually, it's, it's Tuesday when we're recording here. I've just found out earlier today that uh, that Reese has actually withdrawn from the fight due to a, uh, a an unforeseen health concern. Because um, it, it's only gone down today. We don't. Um, I haven't actually managed to get to the bottom of it. But uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a shame for Reese. He's um, you know he's coming off a coming off a loss. Um, you know, and before that, he had two wins on the bounce, and he was pretty close to a um, another title shot. He did challenge for the flyweight title back in uh, 2016, um, and you know, Ji Wei was um, it, on a three-fight win streak, so presumably a win over him would have uh, probably put him close to the title. So, uh, you know, it, it seems a a good opportunity's gone begging, and um, yeah, hopefully uh, all is well with uh, Reese McLaren because yeah, we don't really know what the the nature of it is. Yeah, that's a weird. That's a weird situation to be in, where you're about to fight some guy with a lot of momentum that you can potentially snatch away, and then if it falls like it, it falls through, or it has fallen through like it has now, then you know that's kind of a missed opportunity. And then you know you come back, you heal up, or whatever the case is, if it's an injury or whatever it is, and then they offer you another matchup. Is it going to be one that has same the similar sort of implications, or, or or is it going to just be you know a fight that's kind of more of a tune-up fight for you to get back in there and then you got to build yourself back up and go on a bit of a win streak. Yeah, so it's a weird position to be in. Um, probably just stubbed his toe or something, stood on some Lego and just didn't want to fight. But uh, yeah, that's about all I'll say. I'm not, as I said to you, or fair, I'm not a big fan of the bloke. I don't, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hide that. Um, so yeah, hopefully he heals up, gets back in there soon and I can watch someone else punch him in the face really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> There's some airing out some uh, some beef there, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll 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 wait and see. It's a bit of a watch, watch this space with uh, with Reese McLaren. We don't really know what the uh, what the situation is there, but um, he has been replaced on the card by Josh Tonner, who is a, who is an Australian uh, Muay Thai fighter. He's um, against a Chinese uh, fighter who's I think is making his one debut, from what I can tell. It's uh, Zhang. Pimian, Pimian. Don't know how to. Don't, uh, quite You're nailing these pronunciations. You're just, yeah, you're doing it a lot better than I would be, anyway. Oh, look, we could we could make a highlight reel of all my interviews of the names that I've butchered over the years. Um, I, I was talking, I can't remember who I was. I was talking to River Daz actually. I interviewed River Daz a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and he butchered the name of one of his trainers, I think. And uh, and I sort of, sort of uh, reassured him by saying, "Look, we could uh, we could." We could have a long highlight reel of all the names that I've butchered over the years. So there you go. There's another one to add to the list. But um, 
<laughs> Josh Tonda, he's, he's had quite an extensive career. He's beaten Andy Housen um, in uh, one championship, which is uh, which is no mean feat at all. And uh, he lost to Sam A, who's a, a Thai superstar in his Absolute last fight. Beast. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, he's probably, um, you know, he's, he's got to be in the mix for, for a title fight, really. Yeah. Um, when he's fighting people like Sam A. So, you know, it's a big opportunity for the Chinese uh, Chinese lad as well to take on someone like Josh Tyner in his first fight. So that one's going to be uh, that one's going to be an interesting watch as well. Yeah, that'd be a good scrap. Yeah, like you said, that's kind of yeah, it's an interesting. That's another thing that sort of you know the matchups there that are that are sort of there for for both of these guys if if they can you know capitalize and get a win. They're they're not they're not easy matchups and they're the type of fights that put you. Uh, in the in the running for for a title fight and uh and so you know it just shows you that it's going to be competitive and it's going to be yeah it's going to be sort of a, a delightful fight for the fans to watch exactly and the the kickboxing and the and the muay thai divisions they're not exactly all that deep in in one championship one championship has a has a huge roster they have a lot of divisions across three different sports you know mma kickboxing and muay thai so they can't hold a lot of people in a lot of these, uh, particularly the striking um, weight classes. So, um, a fighter like Josh Shonner is never far away from a title shot. So, um, you know, there's always an opportunity there um, available for them when they when they win. And that's but, uh, sorry, you go. Oh yeah, that's a, that's something interesting about one championship as well too. Like I've seen that they're starting to sign a lot more grapplers as well. So they're obviously trying to build a grappling sort of base as well. But something that interesting about that is when you sign a contract with one championship. Um, for the most part, obviously, there's some sometimes where they're, they're, you know certain people it, it doesn't apply to. But I think for the most part, if, once you sign a contract with one championship, you're not just signing like even if you're an MMA fighter, you're not like in the contract. It'll say like if offered a kickboxing or Muay Thai fight, you have to accept it. So you're not just signed to compete in your discipline, um, which is actually interesting as well. So that's when you've seen some of these other fights come together where you've seen guys who. Are predominantly like maybe a kickboxer or whatever having MMA fights uh, a la Cosimo Alexandra Alexandra whatever his name is fighting um, Sage Northcutt Sage Northcutt and then you know sleeping him so there's some, and obviously now they're doing the Mighty Mouse Rod Tang fight which is modified where they're doing round one and three Muay Thai round two and four MMA so um, yeah they're obviously you know the, the, when you you're looking at what they're putting together and the talent that they have and that's another reason, like you said, in those striking sort of pools, the the talent pool's not overly deep. So it's it's not surprising that you're seeing them throw some of these other matchups together where they're bringing in like some of these MMA fighters to take on some of these more speci- specialized kickboxers. Yeah, I was actually talking to um, uh, Daniel Mini T. Williams about this a little while back when he signed with uh, One Championship. His, his heart's really been in, in MMA. He's been working on his MMA game. He's obviously had an extensive Muay Thai career, but um, you know, when, when he got in contact with, uh, with One Championship, they sort of said to him, um, you know, we need Muay Thai fighters at the moment. We've got quite a few MMA fighters, but uh, we're having trouble signing Muay Thai fighters. So, you know, he obviously uh, signed on the dotted line. Um, the contract was a mixed contract for pre- pretty much, like you say, with uh, pretty much any division Sorry, any sport, any discipline uh, was was really on the table there, and and he uh, they threw him to the wolves there. They gave him Rod Tang in his first fight out, and then uh, he, he fought uh, fought Crudej in his last fight um, in MMA. So, you know, I, I think it's uh, I don't know if it's uh, so much that they have to um, that they have to accept the fight, but uh, you know, he, he said he had signed to fight a a, um, a kickboxing fight I think uh, last year, which got scratched yep. before he then uh, fought Crudej. So you know, it gives him that flexibility there to uh, to you know take on multiple sports, which is um, yeah, it works well for someone like Mini T. You know, he's got his uh, he's got his hand in um, in in both sports there. But exactly. uh, also on the um, uh, in the bigger promotions, we were due to have uh, Aaron Blackie fighting in uh, in PFL, um, and he's also had to withdraw. Um, I've had a couple of days to get to the bottom of this one. I'm told it's a it's a visa issue uh, on the end of uh, on PFL's end, not on uh, not on Aaron's end. Um, I haven't managed to uh, to decipher whether he's actually has to now sit out the season or whether they're going to sort of rebook him. But I, I feel like he may have missed the boat because I think the first round of the of the lightweights is. Uh, 
is this weekend, but I, I don't know that for sure. But uh, again, it's uh, Aaron Black. He's a guy who's been out for, a, a, I think, two or three years now. Um, you know, he's he, he managed to get the opportunity signing with the PFL, and unfortunately, his first fight's gone begging. So, um, you know, another another opportunity. Uh, you know, he, he misses out on another opportunity and uh, and has to sit on the sidelines for a little bit longer. So, yeah, it's a disappointing one for him. Yeah, that's especially like that when it's something that, especially if it's not from his end. I mean, obviously, you know, like you said, we haven't really had time, but it'll all come to fruition, you know, at some point. But if it's not from his end, that's super disappointing and super frustrating, you know, that that something like that's happened. But, you know, if, but then if it comes out that it was something that maybe that his, he lapsed on or his team lapsed on or his management didn't put together, that's going to be, you know, even more frustrating for the poor blokes. And, you know, his job's to train, prepare himself for fight, get there and fight. All this other stuff, that's, you know, that's meant to just, be sorted and be kind of handled and you just kind of not focus on it um so yeah hopefully they can they can they can rebook it or sort something out for the guy especially after you know like you said he's been away for a few years and and now had this opportunity pop up and now it's not working out you know that'd be kind of weird because if the ship has sailed now and they kind of pass on him or kind of go okay whatever you know what sort of what's your next option then what you got to come back to australia and fight fight here in Australia again, try to get on matchups like on Eternal or something like that. Um, and I can I can tell you there's going to be, you know, a few a few guys here that are just going to decline to fight the guy simply based on the fact that he's been out for so long. And it's going to be like they're going to have that mentality of, like, what are you talking about? I mean, you haven't fought for a few years. We need to see you. Um make it to a camp, make it to a fight and fight someone before we're going to be willing to take a matchup with you. It's a, it's a similar situation as like the, the Alan Philpot situation. Um, the guy's been out for too long. You know, a lot of people are just going to decline the fight based on the fact that we haven't seen you make it to a fight. So if you make it to a fight, you get in there, you compete, it all comes to fruition. Then yeah, people can be lining up to fight you. But obviously I know it's a bit of a different situation with, with Blackie and, 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 you know, Alan, it's apples and oranges, but I don't want to see Aaron miss out based on something as trivial as a visa issue that was out of his control. That'd be that'd be shit. We want to see people in the region do well, and if they get these opportunities and these call ups and these you know step ups to these to the next next sort of level and these other promotions, that's awesome. That's what you want to see, and you want to see them do well. I'm not gonna not gonna uh, not going to hate on anyone or, or, or speak ill on them trying to do that and, and especially if they've been given the opportunity. So, yeah, especially when it's something like this, man. Like, it'd be different if the guy, like, if he pulled out of the fight and there was some, you know, it was like a silly reason as to why or some, you know, that he could have controlled or whatever, but something like this that's an issue on their end where they didn't do the right thing, that's super disappointing. Yeah, like we've talked about before, like a, a rising tide lift, lifts all ships, doesn't it? Like we want to see guys going over to these big promotions and representing the region. And, and you know, it's a shame that this one's gone south because obviously Aaron Blackie is a guy who's he's had his injury problems in the past. And uh, and from, from what I've heard, he was fit and, and, and ready to go. So for to lose the opportunity over something like a like a visa is, uh, is incredibly disappointing. But, you know, um, I guess... You know, you've been through your fair share of fight cancellations, right? And I don't know that uh, I don't know uh, really uh, that you've ever pulled out of any fights yourself. But you've had you look down your record on Tapology. There's many cancelled fights there where your opponents have uh, have <laughs> pulled out over the years. And uh, yeah, you know, like what would, what would Aaron Blackie be going through right now? Like he's 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 obviously gone through a camp. He's got this big opportunity, uh, had this big opportunity ahead of him, and it's now fallen south. You know. What can you tell us about what he might be going through at the moment? Oh, man, I bet he's super bummed, super disappointed, especially because, you know, you just have to go look at the guy's social media. The guy's been hyping up the fact that he was going to be doing this he's, and he's put so much pressure on himself and he's going to do this for himself and his family and everyone that believes in him, and as you do. So I bet he's super bummed by it and, and super frustrated. Um, you know, I've only, I've only sort of spoken to Aaron a few times and kind of dealt with him a few times here and there. Dude seems super nice, man. He seems like someone who's just obsessive over the sport and whether it's the training side of things, the coaching side of things and everything in between. Um, so, yeah, I bet he's, he's going to be super bummed, super disappointed and hopefully, yeah, like we said, they can figure something out. But, um, yeah, 
But, you know, on the other side of things, the guy outside of fighting, obviously, hasn't fought for a few years, but outside of the fighting side of things, the guy's obviously coaching. Um, he's got all these online sort of program sort of app things where he's doing all these breakdowns, teaching techniques. The guy's obviously very talented. He's very skilled, uh, not just as a fighter, but as like a, a coach. You know, he's, he's obviously got the knowledge to pass on from the judo side of things, the jiu-jitsu, the MMA, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, he's up there doing good work with base training center. He's doing good work as bros jiu-jitsu, you know, his own sort of gym that he has. And, you know, he's got a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. The guy's obviously, you know, got some good qualifications behind him as well to fall back onto if, you know, that he obviously has been doing while he hasn't been fighting. So, you know, it's not like the end of the world uh, in the scheme of things, but, you know, it, it kind of is in a sense because this is this was a big opportunity and I, you know it should have come to fruition yeah absolutely and uh yeah kind of like you touched on i guess in a fighting sense he's um you know if, if he if he's not getting rebooked with uh with pfl for this season then he's in a bit of a weird situation isn't he like you touched on does he does he come back and sort of uh maybe put his position with pfl on the line or does he sort of uh you know wait it out you know he's waited out this long does he wait it out for next season with uh with pfl it sounds like he's got some other things uh going on to tide him over but uh yeah i guess yep. we'll see uh we'll see what happens with him in the, in the short term but you know, speaking of the the local scene, uh, Urban Fight Night have got a uh, a double event this weekend, uh, which is uh, you know in 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 I guess in the scheme of things in the local scene, it's uh, you know that that's a big weekend. You know, from a from a journalist perspective, it's always a um, it's always a long night and a and a tiring night, sort of uh, sitting there at the at the fights and you know so the thought of uh, of doing it back to back would be uh, would be a pretty huge thing, but. Um, the, the first event is uh, headlined by your uh, former opponent Michael Barber um, and then we've got Josh Togo in the uh, as a former eternal lightweight champion on the second event but uh, have you had a look down the cards and then what, what do you what do you make of, uh, of urban fight night and the, and the, the idea of going back to back in a weekend that's huge yeah I like it I like the fact that they're doing that um, you know gives more people an opportunity to get out there and do their thing especially for some of these amateurs you know it gives them a chance to to get in there get some experience and, and get some fights in obviously yeah the the friday night's headlined by michael and darwin um for the band of my title it should be it should be an absolute scrap um darwin's got bricks for hands and you know he's been known to put people away if he touches them and michael's obviously super scrappy i've, 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 I've fought the guys so i know that firsthand you know he's he's tough he's scrappy won't quit and you look at his last performance against Sam Hibbard, man, the guy made it a dog fight and just put it in. And, and, you know, he can certainly do that against Darwin. I mean, if as the fight goes, you know, I, I certainly see Michael with the ability to kind of make it a gritty fight, drag it out, you know, make it ugly and kind of make it sort of a dog fight and a scrap and be able to grind out a, a decision or, or, or maybe put Darwin away with like a cumulative damage. And then from Darwin's side of things, it's going to be, can he can he land those shots and will he be able to put someone like will he be able to put michael away that's going to be the question he certainly has got the ability to he's obviously hits hits quite hard and he's done that to so many others but i don't know michael's a special kind of guy because i beat the crap out of that dude for three rounds and he didn't quit at any point so um and then i found out after the fact that there's an interesting story about the guy that he actually lost a testicle in an MMA fight that uh, he fought actually a guy that used to fight out of freestyle and he got kicked in the groin uh, really hard a couple of times. And uh, I believe he lost a testicle or had his testicle messed up real bad or something like that. So that, you know, that kind of lets you know the dude's mentality. You know, he's not going to quit mm. if you put him in a choke or if you, you're trying to <laughs> punch him in the face. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, and then obviously, you know, so that makes it interesting. We'll see what happens. And then the, the uh, the Saturday night you got Togo taking on Robbie Lara, which would be, uh, uh, I mean, potential that'd be a great scrap. I don't think, I don't think Lara's fought for a, for a, for a hot minute. It's been a while since he's been in there. Togo's obviously, you know, former champion, beat some sort of super talented dudes. The guys fought on UAE Warriors. Obviously lost to, you know, lost the the eternal title via Rene choke in the fourth round. Um, you know when he, you know in that outing, but you know that that's that's a sort of that fight was 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 kind of quite competitive, and that was the night. I don't know if you remember, but that was the night that there was some issues with the canvas. It was super slippery and caused a bunch mm -hmm. of problems for a few people on the card. It looked like they were fighting on an ice skating rink. So, you know, did that play a factor in him getting caught and 
ending up in a rear naked choke position and getting to submitted? Maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, so I think he's going to come out with extra sort of motivation to put on a show. And even talking to him in the, uh, you know, uh, over the last couple of weeks, the, the guy's super hyped up to come out there and and uh, get a, a devastating finish. So it's going to be it's going to be a delight for anyone that you know sort of watches the fights, whether they attend the events or whether they just stream them and uh, and, and and do that sort of stuff. But for sure, double event back to back both nights. Get out. The people need to get out and support it, and especially for the amateurs, man. This is going to be a, a cool thing to to see that sort of come together for for, for some of these guys. Absolutely. And it's a good thing you bring up there, actually. It's, uh, you know, we've got MMA back in Australia here, so it is important for people to actually get down there and, uh, and, and get involved because, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, lot of these local promotions, I think they kind of, um, they, they kind of scrape by a little bit and, um, you know, so the more people that we can get along, you know, the more it just, uh, it pushes out, it, you know, lifts our, our, our sport and, and lifts all the, uh, the fighters up with it. So yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, uh, that's an important thing. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, anytime there's going to be local events on, you got to like, you got to go out there and support it. There's always that. You see that meme go around, or that sort of thing, where it's like, you know, don't wait till the person's blown up and they're in the big leagues to to try and support them and kind of be like, oh, let's do it, let's do it. Like, let's 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 get behind this person. Like, do it now while they're building themselves up, while they're getting there, and then uh, and then you know, so that by the time they do get to that point, you could be like. I mean, I was there every step of the way. I got to see this play out. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the same could be said for Fight Talk Down Under. You know, don't wait until we're up there rubbing shoulders with Joe Rogan on uh, on Spotify, on, uh, you know, uh, nine-figure contracts and whatever. You know, you can get involved right now. When we're, we're, we're on the come up, we're on Spotify, we're on YouTube, we're on Fight News Australia, we're on Google Podcasts, and we're on Podbean. Everywhere that you get your podcasts, you can get a hold of some quality content and again don't wait until we're uh, we're in the big leagues um for, for me personally um, i've just in- interviewed john wayne parr on monday night so keep your eyes peeled for that one on fight news australia next uh, uh next early next week uh he's got a, a huge fight coming up against eduardo foley young on one uh, x and we'll we'll touch on that uh, that fight card in the uh the, the week ahead but um yeah the, that one's headlined by rod tang versus demetrius johnson so that's going to be a really fun card and uh, john wayne parr's having his uh, his retirement fight on there so uh you can hear from the man himself i uh, had a really good chat with him last night so keep your eyes peeled for that one on uh on uh, fight news australia yeah i guess from my end um potentially looking at fight in april 23rd back in melbourne um so that'll be on eternal hopefully which is already a stacked card there's a bunch of incredible matchups on that card i'll be there i'll be there for it regardless obviously my teammates fighting colby colby thickness will be back in action the golden boy after a year of delays and and stuff rounds he'll be uh he'll be back in the cage and it's going to be something that people want to watch because that guy's super talented and a special athlete um i'm not just saying that because he's my teammate like even before I, I joined freestyle i was always a big fan of that kid um absolute moron can't stand him but the dude can fight but um yeah so that'd be cool and I guess the only other thing is um, there's a few interesting sort of random things that got thrown my way that might be something that will, will join the fight talk down under sort of thing. Um, I've had a few opportunities to talk to some some notable sort of people in the last couple of days that are involved in the UFC and some of these bigger promotions just randomly on like a random sort of whim. So I'm, I'm obviously we'll, we'll liaise with one another and, and kind of put some things together. But if it means that, you know, these people are taking these opportunities that are coming their way and they're going to be on Fight Talk Down Under or involved in some way or give us some sweet gossip or some little things that we, we might not hear and, you know, we might hear ahead of a few other people, I'm all for that. Because like you said, once we've blown up, once we've got that Joe Rogan Spotify deal and we're just balling and making all that money, don't come crawling over trying to get on the train then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, we have to say a big thank you to all those who are listening at this point as well. And uh, yeah, we hope you're all enjoying the content. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for episode six next week. Yep, I'm looking forward to it. I'm already, I'm already thinking about it. Here I am. Risk it all, be worth it now
know and that's for sure. 